Well, hi there, and welcome back to another episode of Let's Talk Real Estate Investing. I'm your host, Sharon Vornhope, and I'm so happy you're tuning in today. My guest is Stephanie Betters, and I'm so excited to have her on today. Stephanie is the co-founder of Better Path Homes, a single-family residential wholesaling and new build company in Charlotte, North Carolina. She's also the founder of Social Media REI, a Facebook marketing company specializing in finding motivated sellers and the founder of Left Main, a CRM for real estate investors through a partnership with Salesforce. She's also the wife and she's a wife and a mother of three and she continues to work part-time as a cardiothoracic surgery nurse practitioner. She believes medicine, her background in medicine has helped her to be a better real estate investor. So welcome to the show, Stephanie. Thank you. Well, it's quite overwhelming when you say it all like that. That was kind of um, <laughs> an overwhelming, like she does all of that kind of thing. <laughs> so um, how did you get started? Let's take it back a little bit. So obviously the nurse part probably came first, but how did, how did you get started and segue from there into real estate? Well, so I met my husband in college and I was very young when we met. I was 19 when we met turned 20 shortly after, but I like to tell him that I've been with my entire adult life, basically. (laughs) Um, And when we met in college, as you can imagine, graduating from undergrad, and we had a lot of student debt. Like We we got married young, I was 21, and we just didn't have any money to buy a house. Mm -hmm. And so this was back in 2007. And what you do, I guess, when you don't have money is you buy a foreclosed house. That's what my husband said anyway. That wasn't my intention. I did not imagine being carried across the threshold to a foreclosed moldy house. (laughs) But um, he somehow convinced me to do this because it made more sense than renting. So in 2007, we did kind of like a house hack and we lived in that house and and renovated it and flipped it and sold it really early 2009 in upstate New York, really right before the bubble burst in upstate New York. We were in Binghamton. Uh, IBM is a major employer there. Mm-hmm. And literally two weeks after we sold it, the market crashed like really hard. Um, but we sold it and we went to grad school. The intention was always to go to grad school. Um, so now, you know, like you said, I'm a nurse practitioner. My husband's a physician assistant. And we graduated grad school now with extra debt. And we had a little bit of money that we made from that prop from that first flip. Thankfully, we did very well on that. And we kind of got the bug like, Hey, that was fun. We can make something pretty and, and renovate it. And then we can make good money with that. So when we graduated, we were, we went to Stony Brook, which is on Long Island. And we were trying to figure out where we were going to go next. Um, Our family at that point was kind of all over the States. No one really was settled. Our parents were thinking about retiring and moving down South. So we kind of just analyzed where could we go if we could go anywhere. And we decided Charlotte would be the best market for our jobs in medicine, but also for real estate investing. And the deal was I would do it again, but I would never live in the house again. (laughs) (laughs) I I have all that sheetrock dust and mold. I have PTSD from all that stress. So I said, we'll do it again, but we've got to wait. Um, So we moved down to Charlotte. At that point, uh, we had a daughter and I was pregnant again. And we were trying to figure out our next move, you know? So what our vision was at that point was just to just to buy some rentals and have some passive income. N- neither one of us ever really envisioned leaving medicine. That's something we're very, we still continue to be very passionate about, but we were, you know, kind of honest with ourselves that this would be a job we would work for our entire lives, you know? And how did, how can we save money for weddings and for retirement and for, you know, whatever future without actively working? Um, and as you can imagine, the, the hours in the medical field are very rigorous. There's not a lot of t- free time after, you know, outside of it. The shifts are long. You know, a 40 hour work week is not a full time position. It's like a part time position. <laughs> so, so we were just looking for passive income. And it took us a little bit of time to find a rental. And, and essentially, when we bought our first rental, the down payment with conventional financing, which was really the only way we knew how to do how to buy a house was conventional. It took all essentially our savings, like between the down payment and the, you know, even light renovation that that first one required, we were kind of at square one again. So we're like, well, shoot, how do we, how do we raise more money and, and and do this faster? Cause it's going to take us forever if we do it this way. So that's when we started kind of researching about other ways to creatively finance, 
how to find off-market deals. So maybe we get a little bit of a discount when we're buying in the first place. Um, and that kind of, that opened up this whole new world for us that we started, you know, and we started learning all about kind of active slash passive real estate investing. So you start, you started with, actually started with rehabbing then, rehabbing. A, so that yep. was, that's where I started. And that's a, um, that's not a place where everyone should probably start. It's, yeah. I loved it, but like you, I don't, I don't really like living in a house I'm, that I'm rehabbing. It's too big of a mess. Yeah. So you, how do you continue before we move on to the real estate? How do you continue to balance the medicine and the real estate? Because that's, that's all very demanding, like you said. Yeah. So it was a bit of a mess in the beginning. Like in the beginning, when you're building your business, you're doing all the things and juggling. And it was very, very stressful. Like I would probably work most hours of the day and into the night. I mean, I would wake up at 5 a.m., get ready to go to the hospital, work all day at the hospital, get the kids to bed, and then I'd work probably till 1 or 2 a.m. and build the business. Zach and I, my husband, both of, I, both of us did this. And we did that for a long time, like probably at that pace for at least a year and a half. I mean, massive amount of hours. I mean, we basically didn't watch TV. We kind of found hours in the day and tried to figure out how we were going to build it. And then, of course, that's not sustainable, right? At, at some point, we learned, okay, we're going to need some help and, and we're, we're, let's start with what hurts the most. And that was things like the phone call, things that were un unpredictable. Uh, when we had to be of service to somebody like, you know, a homeowner calling off of marketing, but yet we're in the middle of crazy lives at the hospital or at home with three babies at that point. So we started hiring people to help us during those, those, those moments where we didn't have control of, you know, of the schedule or the time or life was too crazy. Cause obviously I'm at the hospital, I'm not picking up my phone, you know, but right. then I'm spending all this money on marketing. How, how do we put these two pieces together? So I learned to hire and to, and to get help. That was a difficult lesson for me, <laughs> but, yeah. but once, once you start, you kind of see the future. You're like, okay, I can actually do so much more on such a bet higher level than the actual task itself. Mm -hmm. So when did you move into wholesaling? Was it just kind of a little bit of this, a little bit of that, or did you go strictly into wholesaling? Um, it was a little bit of this and that. So um, let's see, at the end of 2016 is probably when we did our first wholesale deal. Mm -hmm. And that was because we were busy with renovations. Mm -hmm. We The intention was always to flip it ourselves. And then we kind of got in a situation where we had, I think, two flips going on simultaneously. And that felt like absolute chaos. I, I mean, we were so stressed out with these two flips and uh, we, you know, we were talking to homeowners, we got another deal. And, and I remember talking to Zach and saying like, I don't, I can't even imagine closing on this house right now. It's going to sit for three months. We're not ready. Like the crews are behind or whatever. And then he's, you know, I can't remember if it was him or me, but one of us said, what's that wholesaling thing again? You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so then we, we figured it out. We, you know, thankfully along the way, we had gone to local RIAs and kind of met some local investors. So we, we, one of our friends that we met at the RIA, I was like, Hey, do you want, do you, do you want to buy this house? And I think we made like, I don't know, four or $5,000 on the assignment fee, but I was like, Hey, that's kind of nice. Mm -hmm. So that became our, our model. Basically we would, we would lock everything up. Like we were going to renovate it ourselves. So we felt really comfortable with the deal itself. And then if our crews were busy, then we would wholesale. Yeah. Yeah. Your only mistake was you should have gotten 10. I know. Right. <laughs> now I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's kind of, I, I, I got it. I was investing for 10 years before I ever did a wholesale deal. It yeah. was just, and then you look back on it and went, wait a minute, I missed out on a, a, a couple things along the way. So at what yeah. point did you start? So you started to systematize your business and um, get help, just get help. We'll call it that because that's what you really do. It's like you're, you're falling off of a building without a parachute and you finally have to do it because you're, you're a lot like me and that we want to hold on to things. And um, so that's not necessarily a virtue, but when did you start the, the Facebook marketing company? We started that kind of when we first started our business. And so 2016 is really when things started, started happening. 
And it didn't really start as a company. First, we started a business page just to kind of document what we were doing and people that were interested could follow us on our page, mostly because I felt guilty about how much we were posting on our personal page. Mm -hmm. I was just like, oh, shoot, maybe I should probably separate this a little. So we just started our business page and, you know, it got a bunch of followers and and people liked the content, their friends and also people locally I started getting some organic traffic. And I didn't really, it really didn't start clicking until we sent homeowners calling off other marketing pieces. We did a lot of direct mail then, you know, they would call and they were kind of skeptical. How, what is this process? Like, are you guys real? Is this a scam? Yeah. And we're like, no, we're not. We're real people. We're a local company. Here, why don't you check out our Facebook page? We have a bunch of stuff in there. You can see us walking through properties. You can see what, you know, houses are like that we buy, blah, blah, blah. And that d was amazing. We got such great feedback from that. Um, when we would go to appointments, and of course, it was just me and my husband then going to appointments, meeting with sellers, we would arrive and they'd be like, oh my gosh, it's you. I'm like, <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> what did you think it was going to be, you know? Um, and, but what I found was, they already kind of knew us and liked us and trusted us before we even got there. And I was like, wow, this is, we've got to be able to find more people. Like obviously all these people have Facebook accounts. If they're looking at our page, you know, I'm like, my grandma's on Facebook, my mom's on Facebook. We've got to be able to find motivated sellers the same way. So towards the end of 2016, I started figuring, you know, just messing around, trying to make ads, trying to figure out how to get people even in our little funnel. Um, and then in, I started getting some traction and early 2017, I landed a huge wholesale fee. I made over a hundred thousand and one wholesale fee from wow. Facebook. It was insane. And it was funny because we went to that appointment and it had all the things. It had like a no solicitor sign on the door. Uh, we had, she was a high equity homeowner. She wasn't on our high equity homeowner list that we typically mail. Like there was really no other way that we would have gotten her, you know, we couldn't have door knocked her or whatever. So when I got that large fee, I was like, okay, we're onto something here. Let me see if I can test my ads in, in other markets and see if I can reproduce this. So um, I was in the, I, I'm still in the seven figure flipping mastermind. So I reached out to some of my friends that I've, that I've met, met there. And I was like, Hey, can I try this? Can I just put some ads out on your market and see if we can reproduce it? And they agreed and it worked and they started getting leads. They started getting deals. And I was just like, oh my gosh, this is an edge. This is a competitive <laughs> advantage. We can reach people before they go to Google. Like we can establish rapport before we ever meet them. Let's do this. So I hired help. I'm like we're building this out. Let's do it. You know, and the agency was born. It's been around since 2017. That, that is just so, so cool. So you, do you still do direct mail? Let's talk about marketing. Do you, mm -hmm. do you use ads solely or do you do direct mail still? What do you do? Yeah, we do a lot of different things now. We have several different online channels. Uh, we buy a lot of leads off of, you know, these nationwide Google ad sellers, resellers. We do SEO. We do our own Google ads. We do Facebook. Mm -hmm. We do direct mail, but now it's a lot more niche. So we'll mail pre-foreclosures. We'll mail um, people with an auction date on their house. We'll mail vacant land owners because we buy, you know, we do new builds. Um, and we also do um, follow-up you know, physical mail, like mm -hmm. in our system, in our CRM system, we'll, we'll follow up with people who have kind of gone a little cold. We'll follow up with them with, with mail. Cool. Um, what else? We cold call. Mm -hmm. We do some texting, not a ton of bulk texting, um, mm -hmm. which thankfully uh, we weren't reliant on that because that seems to have been changing that industry. <laughs> but we do a lot of, we do, a, we have lots of different channels and I feel like the combination helps us quite a bit. They all cross pollinate. They really yes, do. It does. And that's something that I've always told people is you need a minimum of three to five lead channels. Mm -hmm. And after a time, they, they do do that. And especially once you get into the online space, mm -hmm. they, it, it, it is so important to build that know, like, and trust thing. And it's, it's just a proof of concept that you did that with your Facebook page. Because I've told yeah. people before, it, you can, I believe you should have a website. But if you don't start with a Facebook page, but build something yeah. that shows your credibility, like you said, that you're a real person when you yeah. show up to look at a house, it makes all the difference in getting the deal. Yeah. I mean, think about our target, their, our target audience. They're, they're afraid of being taken advantage of. They understand they have a problem and they need to sell quickly and they're just afraid, right? Mm -hmm. that, that fear is that first thing. So how do we how do we combat that? And I think a big part of how we combat that is with 
empathy and being real and being a local small, you know, family owned company. That's, that's most of our stories, you know, and but I think we should lean into that. That's a big, that's, and it, it, it that's another point is it doesn't have to be complicated. It just has to right. be real. Like I'm yeah. a mom with three kids and about 20 jobs, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so Let's move to, on to the, the CRM because this is sure. a fascinating topic. People say, what was your first CRM? And it's almost embarrassing now to say, but I had a big old um, desktop act database was made for b- big companies and the fields, I knew the fields because it was not easy to customize. So it would say some random word and I knew that was first the first name of the seller. And then when I just went wanted to go online, there really weren't a lot of options. And I tried that CRM. Well, it was pieced together and it totally didn't work as one of the first online versions. But moving from, there was this gap in the middle between online CRMs and desktop CRMs. And it was just a big hot mess, Stephanie. It was It was trying to figure out what the heck am I going to do? Because in order to get help, to get virtual help, you have to have an online CRM. Right. You do. So, but I'm Salesforce now, in my mind, Salesforce was for agents. Is that not the case? No, in general, out of the box, Salesforce is for businesses to businesses, okay. you know, accounts, having accounts with multiple, for example, like manufacturing, et cetera. Um, it was difficult to, to get this for, for homeowners, basically a business to person account, business to mm-hmm. customer account. Um, out of the box, it doesn't work that way. Um, so you have to do a lot of development and things to get it to get it personalized, which is why I think it's become, it, up until now, it was a huge, there was a huge cost barrier. Mm-hmm. Like it's, lit- I mean, I, I went through the development calls trying to figure out if that's what I wanted to do and literally framework basic stuff for, to get a Salesforce developer to build you is a hundred grand. I mean, it's outrageously expensive. Um, So thankfully I I was pigheaded enough and got mad enough that I just built it myself, but I I probably lost a couple of brain cells along the way. Um, But now I think now it's a lot more affordable because there's a turnkey solution for our industry. Um, But you're right. There really wasn't much there for for real estate. Um, And and Salesforce noticed what I built, especially I I got really mad on the call when they told me how much it was going to be. So I probably made a little bit of a scene and they remembered me from that, <laughs> but they followed up with me later, um, you know, a few months later to see if I was ready to go for the development. And I said, no, I built it. I'm like, what do you mean you built it? I'm like, I built it. Do you want to see? You know? And they're like, well, we want to see. I said, okay. So I showed them and then they flew to Charlotte and um, wanted to come to the office and meet me. And they said, this is fantastic. This is a white space. This is a new industry. We want to partner with you and bring it to other people. If you think people will be interested. Wow. So that's kind of like the quick version of how that happened. So is this an, an affordable solution for people now? Yes. Now there, the way it works is there's a Salesforce site licensing fee. So you get the enterprise edition of Salesforce, which is important because it, that's an infinite, essentially building block. I mean, you can do anything with the entire Salesforce platform and it has my app embedded into it. So there's a one-time license fee, which is 5,000 and then it's $50 a user a month. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's, I think it's very comparable in price, you know, it's competitively priced. I think um, I'm able to sell it at the floor price that Salesforce will allow me to sell it for a lot of developers mark it up and sell it at sticker price. And that's how they make, you know, the big bucks, but I'm here to bring this to the, our industry. And I'm thinking long-term. Yeah. So, so 5,000 and 50, $50 a month. Yep. Yep. $50 a user a month, a user a month. Yeah. So Back in the day when I was using ACT, it was, uh, I knew people like at GE that were using ACT. It was, yeah. it, w- it was that type of a similar, similar thing, but it was very difficult to customize yourself. Very yeah. difficult. So it was, it took me like 300 hours or something. Oh my like gosh, that. 300 hours. Oh, good grief. Yeah. So yeah. tell us, talk a little bit about women in real estate. I know that <laughs> you, you are passionate about that and I'm passionate about that. And we, we have moved past the part where it's, it's such a struggle, but I, I see women struggle all the time to, to, to get a space in the room uh, in the real estate investing world. So what's your take on all of that? Oh, I think 
it's exciting and it's complicated all at the same time. I think inherently as women, we, we have additional roles and we have a lot of guilt, right? Like there's no such guilt as a mother guilt, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and, and I, unfortunately, one of the very first things that people assume about women or ask about for women is, do you have children? Or mm-hmm. are you going to have children? Yes. Uh, and, you know, I guess there's a reason for that because most of us do. Um, but that's like the first thing that we all need to overcome as a woman. Um, how do I address that question? Right. Um, and then if I am a mother, how do I address my career? Because I can't give up my motherhood role. And because that's so important. And any time that you take time away from the family, that burden is felt. And there's a lot of guilt associated with that. So. I think that the path forward really depends on support, you know, that you have at the house with the kids and, you know, with your personal life, you know, unfortunately, I think it's kind of built in for men a little bit more than women, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you have a a wife, generally they assume those roles and not the man. Um, But I will say that just like behind every successful man is a woman behind every successful woman is a support system and, you know, your partner, right? So I think that that's really important. If you and you need to confront kind of those gender roles and your your roles in each other's life and your your roles in each other's professional life. And that needs to be a discussion of what you want and what they want. Um, so I've had these conversations with my husband and when we when we got married, I was always gonna work. That I it, I didn't even consider like being mm-hmm. a stay-at-home mom ever. I might want a children, but that was I'm like, I have things to do. I've I've like I'm excited to learn, excited to be out there. And this is just how we're going to organize our life. It's going to, there's going to have to be some sort of balance between family and career. And little did I know that real estate would be, you know, part of that career, but medicine is very male dominated too, especially yeah. when you talk about the provider role, you mm-hmm. know, most nurses are women, but when you talk about, you know, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, physicians, most of them are, are, are male. Mm-hmm. Um, at least, at least we're kind of catching up on that too. But so I think you have to approach it with a support system and being like really honest about what you want and how you're going to manage everything and you're going to need help. And I, I think that's just a, just a harsh reality. You need help. You need, you need help in the house. You need a babysitter. You need maybe a nanny to help you juggle all the things at the house to, to get your career stuff done. And that kind of helps ease a little bit of the guilt. But aside from that, aside from kind of the support system at home, which I think is inherent, really, if you're male or female, um, in real estate, just like in medicine, you keep your eyes forward. I'm not looking at the peanut gallery. I'm not looking to see who notices if I'm a woman or not. Like, mm-hmm. I've just got stuff to do. Just like I felt about medicine. I've got ideas. I've got, I'm trying to move the needle for my family. I'm trying to move the needle for the industry, for the community, whatever. And I, you know, why does it matter if I'm a woman or not, you know? I love that because it shouldn't be a conversation that we're having two decades after I first started having that conversation. It should not even be a conversation. Um, It's funny because I managed a medical practice um, that was, that was my, that was kind of my other life too. So um, yeah, I worked for a strong female physician um, who told me about the struggles, she was older than me, she, about the struggles of her coming up and her determination. It went back to things like, um, they told her she had to wear a dress in the OR. And she said, do the men wear dresses? Do the men wear pants? I'm wearing pants. Because she was a trailblazer. I mean, a, a firecracker. And she just, when I think back to the, the things that she had to do to make her own way, it was another whole level of hard. It was yeah. really and truly, but like you, I just made the decision to go forward with my plans and, yeah. and be aware of everything that was around me. But um, I don't think gender should play a role in, in any of it. I think, I think women are especially suited for a real estate investing. I yes. believe that to my core and particularly in one of the niches I work in, which is probate investing. Women are so good in that role. Yeah. So what final advice could you leave people with today if they are feeling like they can't find their place or they can't find their way? What, what would you tell them to do? I think you start with what you love and you, and you start with the end in mind. You know, what, what do you want out of all this? You know, is it, 
Is it financial security? Is it impact? Is it, what is it? You know, variety. There's a lot of different reasons why I think people make decisions. I think they seek security, they seek creativity, variety, you know, whatever, right? Uh, stability. Um, there's a lot of different reasons why we make decisions. So start with, with, you know, knowing thyself and what you really, really want. And then concentrate on the areas that you love because that's what grows. You know, that the whole, as, as things get systemized, as you make progress and you do more and more of what you love all day long, the world opens up to you. You know, like the right people somehow fall into your lap. Like, it's kind of like that saying, like the harder you work, the luckier you get. Yes. Well, the harder you work and in and, and my heart, I really mean like focus and energy mm-hmm. in the areas of your career that you love the most opportunity opens up for you and it feels so natural does that mean you're not going to have crappy days where you cry in the basement or you cry in your bathroom (laughs) like yes you're going to have those days I definitely do the same thing the bathroom is my cry place Um, but you know those days where you feel empowered and energized and excited about what you're doing are you know so much more so much more than you ever imagined so start with what you love what is it about the business that you love is it the deal analytics is it the is it kind of like the step-by-step process? Is it talking to the homeowners? Is it organizing? What is it? You know, we all have our, our thing that we love and start there. That's great advice. Great advice. Um, I do think, like you said, the heart, you know, the whole thing about luck is certainly true, but I do believe that if you, you can make a, a decision deep within, with, uh, in you, with inside you, and you can, decide that you're going to do this and once you make that decision and you have you have to make it with support there's no doubt about that and I do think you brought up a good point about getting help people um we we've all been guilty of waiting too long to get help so Mm -hmm. congratulations on putting that out there for women it's okay to get help you can't do it all well Stephanie thanks so much for coming on the show today this was so much fun and um I love the fact that you've built all these businesses, that you have all this stuff going on. I'm truly in awe of how you get it all done. So folks, um, be sure and share this show. And if you liked it, leave us a rating and a review over on iTunes. I would really appreciate it. And I will see you same time, same place next week. Bye for now. Thanks, Stephanie. Thank you.